Hi, my name is Sharon Chen. This video is part one about the pathogenesis and clinical manifestations of tuberculosis infection and disease. The learning objectives are to describe factors that determine if a person will become infected after an exposure to MTB, to recognize the difference between TB infection and TB disease, and to explain the steps in the MTB life cycle that lead to latent TB infection. Here's an overview of the MTV life cycle that we have shown you before using our framework. The first step is enter. In an infected person, MTB is transmitted through respiratory droplet nuclei. A person's cough or sneeze produce these small droplets, which then evaporate into dried out droplet nuclei and become airborne for hours. The next step is colonize. MTB does not colonize the upper airway, but has to reach alveoli. Droplet nuclei are very small and more easily reach the alveoli compared to large droplets that are trapped in the upper airway. Each droplet nuclei contain around one to three MTB bacilli. Once the droplet nuclei containing MTB is in the alveoli, patrolling alveolar macrophages engulf the bacilli. Although MTB bacilli are phagocytosed by alveolar macrophages, they don't all die. MTB is able to survive within the macrophage by evading the innate immune response. The next part of the life cycle is persist. The hallmark of MTB infection is the granuloma. This is a well-organized, multicellular structure of immune cells recruited to surround a foci of infection. However, granulomas are not just a site for trapping and killing bacteria. They are also a, a site where MTB can persist and actively modulate the immune response to grow and then exit. The next step is replicate. MTB replication can occur intracellular inside live mac macrophages, inside dying macrophages, and also extracellularly in necrotic tissue. The next step is exit. In a subset of infected people, there is a disruption of the granuloma with MTB bacilli continuing to replicate. As the infected cavity expands, it erodes into the airway. MTB can now exit the host via, via a person coughing and transmit to another host fulfilling its life cycle. MTB has adapted to become a very successful human pathogen. How successful? Well, here are some frightening numbers. One third of all humans are infected with MTB. That equals 2.3 billion people. Every three seconds, a person is infected with MTB. Every minute, three people die from TB. The result is that 1.5 million people will die of TB this year, and almost all of these deaths occur in the most impoverished and economically vulnerable countries. In contrast, only 536 deaths due to TB occurred in the U.S. in 2011. So I just told you that 2.3 billion people are infected with MTB. However, only 8 million of those people have active TB disease. Why is that? Tuberculosis infection does not equal tuberculosis disease. Although many people use the words infection and disease to mean the same thing, for tuberculosis, infection and disease mean very different clinical manifestations. Let me show you a flow diagram that I will use to illustrate the difference between TB infection and TB disease. And in the subsequent slides, I will give you more details. After a person is exposed to MTB, not everyone is infected. The majority of people exposed will not be infected. A minority will be infected. Infection depends on several factors that we will discuss. Of those people who are infected with MTB, almost all will respond with some level of immune control of MTB and enter an asymptomatic, non-contagious, latent infection state. 10% of people infected will continue to progress to active infection state that is termed TB disease. Half of them will progress to TB disease within two years after infection. The other half will progress sometime in their lifetime. People with active TB disease show clinical symptoms. This can involve the lungs, pulmonary disease, or other organs, extra pulmonary disease. People with pulmonary TB disease are contagious and can then expose and infect others. Now let's discuss MTB entry. What factors determine whether or not a person becomes infected with MTB? An important factor is infectiousness. That is, what's the concentration of MTB expelled into the air? People with a productive cough for a long time will expel more MTB in the air. In contrast, young children have a less forceful cough and typically don't transmit MTB. 
People with cavitary lesions and laryngeal involvement typically expel large amounts of MTB into the air. Their sputum usually shows MTB bacilli by acid fast staining, as you can see in the image, and is a good marker of high concentrations of expelled MTB. The amount of exposure and the environmental setting are also important factors. Longer, closer, and more frequent exposure, especially in closed indoor rooms with poor ventilation, increase the risk of infection. As healthcare providers, we are at higher risk of exposure and infection to TB compared to the general population. This is why you will wear special masks when evaluating patients with TB infection. A typical mask looks like the one in the picture, which shows a child with TB being transported to another hospital. Both the doctor and the patient are wearing these masks. This is also why prisons, homeless shelters, and refugee camps are high-risk situations for TB infection. Sunlight is actually helpful because through evolution, MTB lost its protection against UV light in contrast to other mycobacteria. Now let's discuss colonization. The preferred niche of colonization by MTB is the macrophage. Ironically, the role of a macrophage is to actually destroy invading microbes and remodel tissues. After entry into the alveolar space, MTB are engulfed by alveolar macrophages into a phagosomal vacuole. The video shows you a macrophage ingesting bacteria. I said before that not all MTB bacilli die within a macrophage after being engulfed. So how does MTB survive? It uses virulence factors like their bioactive cell wall lipids to modulate the immune response. For example, one of the lipids called LAM can block the macrophage phagosome from fusing with the acidic and hydrolytic lysosomes. Phagolysosome fusion is necessary to kill engulfed MTB. Certain lipids can reduce the secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines, maintaining the macrophage in an inactivated state. PDIM is a lipid that can physically hide PAMPs, or pathogen-associated molecular patterns, on the cell surface of MTB, thus evading toll-like receptor signaling. The drawing represents MTB surviving within a phagosome of a macrophage. During this stage, MTB not only survives within the macrophage, but it can multiply and spread to neighboring macrophages and dendritic cells. In fact, MTB-infected macrophages and dendritic cells can carry the bacilli to other locations in the lung, to local lymph nodes, and hematogenously to virtually any organ in the body. Although MTB is actively replicating and disseminating through the body, the person is entirely asymptomatic and no tissue damage occurs during this period of primary infection with MTB. The next part of the life cycle that I want to discuss is persist. As MTB replicates within macrophages, MTB begins to modulate the immune system to induce the initial formation of a granuloma. For MTB, granulomas are important for persistence. It's an ideal niche for long-term survival. Granulomas are nodular foci of inflammation and are formed by a collection of many different types of immune cells. MTB orchestrates granuloma formation using virulence factors. For example, TDM is a type of glycolipid in the cell envelope that induces TNF-alpha and chemokines to recruit inflammatory cells to the site. The ESXA ESAT-6 secretion system of MTB promotes macrophage apoptosis and signals the nearby epithelium to recruit more macrophages. Granulomas are not only a niche for MTB persistence, but also function as traps as it organizes the collection of immune cells. Some of these immune cells are lymphocytes, and specifically T cells that have been activated specifically to fight against MTB. Recall that in the colonization phase, dendritic cells carrying MTB migrate to a local lymph node. Here, they present MTB antigens to T cells. And then these T cells activated specifically against MTB, or so-called MTB-specific T cells, migrate to the site of the early granuloma. In TB infection, these steps are very delayed. It takes several weeks for MTB-specific T cells to finally migrate to the developing granuloma. An activated adaptive immune response is important in the development of a mature granuloma. A maturing granuloma contains additional cells. More MTB-specific T cells are apparent. Once at the site of the developing granuloma, 
MTB-specific T cells can produce interferon gamma and other cytokines to activate macrophages within the developing granuloma to kill MTB. Other macrophages differentiate into epithelioid structures that enclose the infected cells. You can see these in the drawing as a more oblong-shaped green macrophage. Some of the macrophages turn into lipid-laden, foamy macrophages that can sustain live MTB, offering a source of lipid nutrition. Collectively, the function of the MTB-specific T cells and other components of the adaptive immune response at the granuloma is an important step in finally controlling MTB replication. As you can see here, most of the MTB bacilli are destroyed as the granuloma matures. However, some bacilli remain alive within granulomas, sometimes for decades. During this period, the person is asymptomatic, but she is still infected with the MTB, and we call this phase of TB infection latent TB infection, or LTBI. People with a latent TB infection are not contagious. But importantly, they have the potential to progress to active TB disease, which will induce symptoms in that person. As I said, a person with latent TB infection shows no symptoms. Clinically, it is very difficult to detect when a person has latent TB infection. There are some tests, including the tuberculin skin tests and interferon gamma release assays, which I will discuss in other videos. Chest radiographs are typically normal, but sometimes can show localized infiltrates and a hyalur adenopathy, called the GON complex, or these can be calcified, called the Ranke complex. In the chest x-ray, the left arrow points to the tiny nodule that was the primary focus of infection, and the right arrow points to calcified hyalur lymph nodes, which is where dendritic cells first brought MTB. TB infection is quite complex, so I want to review the timeline. After alveolar macrophages engulf MTB bacilli, it is a matter of days for MTB to replicate within macrophages and neighboring recruited macrophages and dendritic cells. It takes weeks for MTB to orchestrate recruitment of immune cells and differentiation of macrophages to initiate mature granuloma formation. MTB continues to replicate within the developing granuloma. There is a long delay, around three to nine weeks, for MTB-specific T cells to arrive and proliferate at the granuloma site, finally controlling MTB replication. MTB-specific T cell proliferation and continued activation heralds the beginning of a latent state. Most of MTB are killed, but a few can survive and remain latent within the granuloma.